it's episode 378 of This Is Whole Life. 378. I don't know how we got that far. And overall, we're closing. I was going to check and I forgot. We're almost to 400 total episodes with bonus episodes. Are we going to do anything special when we get to 400? I don't know. We said we were going to do something special when we got to 350. And we I just, know, we and didn't. It just, so it just I, didn't happen. I really think we need to, Randy. I don't know. I've been thinking, like, where would be, you know, we, we think about this every time and try to find something cool. And I'm not sure. Maybe we should call Advent Health and it's like, you know, can we go up on the top of the, the building up there? There's some space up there and you could oversee downtown we could you know invite some people have a little you know cheese and cracker party <laughs> while we do that because we're a cheese and cracker group yeah, right well yeah. we're a food group i don't know i mean <laughs> that's true so we could you know we could have an, an array i think that of... we ought to take suggestions randy yeah. i think that those of you who are listening should give us some suggestions <laughs> where would if we actually did a live podcast where would you show up yeah to be a part of it to be there for the 400th episode that'd be pretty cool 400. What number are we on right now? This is 378. So we have a little bit of time. We have some time to think about it, yeah. but uh, you should definitely write in. Where do, where do they write into, Randy? Uh, podcast at wholelife.church. Podcast you know, at wholelife.church. What? You know, they have some pretty good sized pontoon boats these days. Might be cool to go out in the middle of the lake and. And find uh, internet out there. Well, no, we don't. We don't need internet. <laughs> no, we just need. Uh, the, this runs, the board runs on four AA batteries. So. Okay. I feel like there'll be more people than that. I guess I guess be. I guess we could have like a flotilla though. Yeah, maybe. Ooh, oh, what about Crane's Roost? Do you think they do you think they shove the big stage out into the center of <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't for our 400th episode? That's right. I mean, Come on. I'm sure well, that they'd be delighted to do just that. Just in case you're new here. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. We discuss on this whole whole life. We discuss the ideas and the things that we discuss after each week's message here at the church. And so if you have something to add, you can do that as the aforementioned podcast at wholelife.church or 407-965-1607. That is our text number. And speaking of text numbers and apologies, Mariana Parente. Randy was a bad host. He got the text message. He printed it off last week, and he left it on the copy machine before we came in to record. Uh, <laughs> and she's oh. like, I was a little disappointed yeah. that you didn't read my text. And I'm like, I, I, yep, bad Randy. So before we get started, this is going to be a question and comment from Mariana Parente. She is a faithful weekly listener. And this was after the two by two episode. This is after last week. Right. But it was really encapsulating two by two, and then the week prior, so okay. which she does go over. So she said, I can definitely relate to this week's and even last week's sermons as I felt they were intertwined. The feeling of unworthiness is real, and many times I have questioned God, why me? I've asked him that question in two different ways. One, why is this happening to me? If I am your child, why are you allowing all this suffering? And two, why did you choose me? I'm so broken and my personality is so wrong for your kingdom. Why me? How can you use me? Is it wrong to question God this way or should we just trust and take it? Mm, <laughs> trust and wow. Take it. <laughs> I loved the last trust uh, and take, take it. it. And my personality is so wrong for your kingdom. And I was like, wow. So I'm not the only one. Thank you also <laughs> Anna, for expressing some thoughts that many of us may not want yeah. to verbalize. I think only Jesus' personality is perhaps... Uh, Ready for that. <laughs> yeah. Sufficient. So I totally get that. I definitely feel that way at times as well. And so I don't know. I don't know if I'd... I don't know if I quite word it the way that, uh, Marianne, that you <laughs> that you word it there, but I would say that uh, the more that we can live in a state of accepting the grace that's being freely offered, the better, and the more peace we'll find in our own life. But questioning God, I think we're, I think I'm okay. Questioning God on why, I'm why not, he picked us? Uh, yeah. Uh, is it a, wrong to question God in this way of like, why is it happening? Why the suffering? Why me? How well, do you? How can you use me? There are two very different pieces to that, right? Yeah. One is one is why I'm not I'm not a worthy yeah. right. candidate, okay. which is the part I kind of heard. Yeah, okay. and which I think is, I think if you're asking that question, isn't that isn't that where Christ really wants you to be? I, yeah, I think that's the piece of humble acceptance where okay, I'm gonna. Go along with this. I don't know what you see, but I'm going to go along with <laughs> yeah. it. Honestly, I'm that. That's so much better than yeah. I, well, yeah. you're lucky to have me right. at it too, because Ooh, yeah. I find that when we when we're in that state of Lord, I don't know why you've chosen me. I'm grateful that you have, but yeah. I, you know, then we're a lot less critical of other people, mm -hmm. a lot yeah. more open 
to the fact that if God could choose me, then then God uh, then it makes plenty of sense for Him to choose the other people. And I well. think it does connect with the other piece too. It's that yeah. Yeah. now I I I know I know very little about why God chose me, and I know even less why I'm going through this suffering. But but it it does sort of. You know, put together a, a piece of humble acceptance. Yeah. yeah. Or applying to what, what you just said about me. I don't know. why. I have no idea why you picked me. <laughs> but I also might look at someone that I don't really like that much or that I haven't figured out well enough to like or to dislike maybe, but to also think of it in that term when I go, that really annoyed me. Or this person, I don't get that. Like, Or you start feeling more superior than them. Also ask that question, you're like, well, why? if I don't understand why God chose me, maybe they don't understand why God chose them. We may all be in the same boat here trying okay. to figure out why or what is God's purpose for us. Well, I think it puts us on the same le- an even level. You know, uh, and, you know, you hate to, to prolong stuff like this, but patience is a pretty important word. Oh, no. <laughs> I, knew, I knew patience was going to have to work its ugly head yeah. in here somewhere. <laughs> I don't, and, but no, I don't think it's wrong to ask God, why me? Why are you, no, why are you allowing this to happen? I mean, we see Job kind of doing that. We mm-hmm. uh, see Jonah run from God. We see Elijah go have a pity party off in the desert. <laughs> even We even see Jesus say, I don't want to drink from this cup, but not my will, but yours, and, and which is... I think probably the perfect response to the suffering that comes into our life, but it's a hard one. Yeah. But you know, I think it, if Jesus could tell God, ah, "This is not really what I want to be doing right now," but I'll do what you want me to do, then I think that's uh, that's probably where we're striving to be. Mm. I think that while you're in the middle of it, like when you're literally in the middle of suffering, anything like what we're saying here means very little yeah. because it, you know, you're just in the, in the middle of it. Yeah. But I do think that the one thing that he does provide is he says, however, you are still a part of me and my body. Mm, yeah. And if you have nothing else, in other words, if there's no other rational or reasonable way to explain it, at least you're not alone, that there are people I am with you. There are others in my body that are with you. I think that's the the only thing sometimes when you're in the middle of suffering that you can you can even hold if on we can to. remember that as a gratitude point. I know we talked about that mm-hmm. in the staff today about gratitude yeah. and and I mean gratitude is a huge huge deal. Yeah. And if even the one like one small part, if you could just say, I am grateful today because for some reason, God loves me. I'm not really sure what it is. I'm not sure why he's here. And I'm certainly not sure why I'm going through all this suffering. At least if I can say, but I know God loves me, it might be a piece to offset some of the... Well, I again, I'm going to go back to if you're in the middle of suffering and somebody comes to you and says, well, why don't you try being grateful? Oh, that's they're <laughs> they're going to probably... Why don't you shut up? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Uh, it's just there's very yeah. few uh, antidotes, That's so true. to speak. Yeah. They all seem pretty trite at that point. Yeah. Like they're not. Uh... Okay, let's move on for the rest of the episode. Thank you, Mariana, as always, for your comments. We appreciate you listening. And if you want to send in your comments, it's podcast at wholelife.church or 407 965 1607, although clearly that might be the sketchier way to do it because randy forgot to put that in from last week so maybe the i don't know if the email or text is we will get to it and if i don't just send me a nice little email like she did and let me know that i forgot and we'll make sure that we rectify it for the next episode all right so this week it was the last one tear in my eye nine weeks coming to a close season two episode one thunder and we're done with spoiler alerts. Now it's all yeah, fair, oh, it's all fair game because yeah. it is what it is. So as we do with each one of these as to whose favorite episode it was, can give us a just a quick overview of why this episode for the last one, considering it was season two, episode one, and last week was season three, episode two. Why this one and why? Yeah. why it really why? came down to the opening closing scene for me. Okay. Um, the opening scene is John interviewing the other disciples and Mary, mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, trying to kind of figure out what... Uh, what he wants to write about, trying to get his what his book is and where he's going to start, and then the the episode ends with 
him realizing where he wants to begin, and that's in Genesis, actually. And so there's this beautiful montage between he and Jesus. Jesus is speaking in a Samaritan synagogue. He's he's speaking from the first um, book in, in the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, and he's speaking from the first chapters, in the beginning God created the heavens, the earth, and all them in them is. In the beginning the earth was formless and void. And in that formless and void talks about, the, basically another way to translate it is that the earth was in chaos, that it was in chaos. And God, in the form of Jesus, brings order out of the chaos of this and creates this perfect place, this perfect earth, puts perfect people into this perfect garden. And then these human beings come come along and they they mess things up and kind of return the world back to chaos. <laughs> and so the whole point of this, when and there's a lot of eclectic kind of seeming things in this episode. In fact, when I first watched, it, I was like, oh, "How does this all even piece together?" There's just a lot of different stories in here. But the underlying current for this is how Jesus brings order out of chaos. It's mm-hmm. how Jesus redeems what's broken. Yeah. And how he doesn't love us once we're perfect, but rather he loves us before we're perfect and then loves us into perfection. And so that's why I wanted to leave that here because what I as as I've often said and will say often again, Jesus is everything. Beginning, end, middle, everything in between. Jesus is everything. And as we closed off this series, what I wanted to encourage people to do is know Jesus for yourself. The Chosen is a tool for getting to know Jesus. It's a way to fire up your imagination about who the G- real Jesus um, was, the disciples, and to to make them people. You know, sometimes when we read the Bible, we we kind of create these stained glass stories as opposed to the flesh and blood stories that 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 these people were. The Chosen is just a springboard for doing that. Use your own holy imagination when you read through the Gospels. When you read, put some, you know, put. Put flesh and blood on these people. Where are they coming from? Why do you think Jesus said it that way? What what could have been going on? Create an environment that that allows you to think about that and why Jesus might have said that and and what he's saying to you today. So I really wanted people to walk out of this episode knowing Jesus better and being inspired to get to know Jesus better and then share Jesus with other people. Well, and I think maybe sometimes we expect too much out of a production of sorts of this, of the telling of Jesus's life here on earth. But I think they've gone above and beyond oh, yeah. what, what I, what, at least what I expected. Cause it was like, Oh boy, another, you know, someone's going to tackle the Bible, you know, the Bible story. Oh, I was so surrounding expecting Jesus. this to be so cheesy when yeah. the first one <laughs> I was like, I, I, was I watched it cause somebody yeah. was like, Oh, you've got to watch this Graham. I'm like, yeah, you probably thought this- Tammy was the one yeah. that told us to watch it. And I was like, really? Because I trust your wife's judgment when it comes to... Well, I I think there was a criticism side to this, and that is that, you know, well, this a lot of this stuff is conjecture, right? Sure, yeah. But I think that we need to be open to conjecture. I think because, just like you said, Ken, there is this element of moving into these stories and, and having ideas as to what might be the context to some of the stories that aren't complete. They're not complete stories. We don't have a lot of the backstory like we're given in The the Chosen. But what it does do for us is it creates a curiosity for us to do, and by the way, they have done a ton of research yes, yeah, for this. And I like the fact that you had mentioned a while ago, or maybe it's recent, um, that there are little, nine weeks. It all bears a little bit. There are little, weeks, there are little um, Easter eggs, so to yeah. speak, in these series. Absolutely, to look for. And I think, if nothing else, if we're going to be critical of conjecture, then we also need to be curious about it, because I, I would say, yeah, you can always criticize somebody for their ideas. But until you do some research on your own, you might be just being critical. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is that each one of us that listens to sermons from whoever we listen to sermons from are listening to somebody's ideas and beliefs yeah. about what they have studied and read. And so, you know, when you watch The Chosen, I run it through the same filter I run through any speaker that I'm listening to or anybody who's sharing. Is, you know, does that line up with the, the Bible as I have read it? If it does. If I'm not sure, I go back to the source. Sometimes even when I'm sure, I'm like, oh, let me read that again and see. Oh, yeah, I can see where they could get yeah. that from. And so, um, and then I just also file it away in my head is this is just, this is holy imagination. This is somebody just using their imagination. And so, 
Yeah, I, I think uh, we're always richer when we have other people's perspectives on things. Yeah. And to hear, you know, I mean, can't tell you how many times I've heard a pastor tell a Bible story I've read a thousand times, and they add something from their life experience. I'm like, oh, wow, mm-hmm. that, yeah. that story yeah. suddenly is so much more meaningful to me than it was before. And that's, I think, one of the beautiful things that The Chosen does. They take and they they just they go, oh, that could have been. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. And they're using Jesus's words mm-hmm. from the Scripture, and then they're adding these other pieces to it. And I think part of what makes it so powerful is, in just taking this past episode— Having them all being aged a little bit yeah. in, in makeup and you know the gray hair, <laughs> yeah. they've changed a little, and yeah. you know they're they're still the sense of humor of the character, younger characters are still there, and the different uh, idiosyncrasies, whatever that they're all still there, but it gives you the idea then that. Yeah, they they lived with him, but they also lived without him, which is easy to forget sometimes. And then the just being set in that period, like you watch a good western. I'm a big sucker for a good a good a good <laughs> western, but you know I didn't live in didn't live in the 1800s and when the Wild West and you know the Gold Rush and all the different things that are happening, and you get a taste for what life was like based on if you've ever been to Colorado, like to Leadville, places like that, where you there's yep. ghost towns and you're like, oh, okay, well, this is, okay, we can kind of put ourselves in there. You can tell someone a story visually or by word, but then when you also add visually, you're, you're taking theirs as well as yours, which I kind of like because we've already been through, most of us as Christians have been through these stories already. And when the two sides clash, it makes you go, wow, I never, ever would have thought about it that way. But then in many cases, I found that watching The Chosen has also, to me, it's almost solidified the way I felt about Jesus. Mm, Like like Jesus would be this really compassionate person who at times we know would be stern. He never backed down from telling the truth. But you always, I always imagined him as being the opposite of people in my life that would beat you with you know, facts, figures, and text, but just say, yeah, we all know, you know, like when he's telling the woman at the well, you know, he's not your husband either, you know, saying it, but saying it being to the point, but saying it in a nice, kind way. And for some of us, that's something we've had to learn to do in our yeah. lives to be more compassionate. And it, that really resonated with me a lot. So my favorite part of the show is that the way they portray Jesus is the Jesus I've I have in my head of who I think he is and it, it, it closely matches. And in some cases I think it's better than what mm-hmm. it's given me a different perspective mm-hmm. that I think has actually improved that. So I'm I think just so impressed with what they've done. They've, I mean, I don't know if there's anything harder than taking a story that a lot of people have heard before and making it fresh and new without yeah. destroying the original right. story. And, and when you actually enhance that story and, and they've done that in my mind, uh, you know. This might be the best remake in history. Uh, I mean, sequels, <laughs> sequels are never the be- as good as the originals, yeah, but, yeah, you know, it's yeah. pretty good. All right. <laughs> the clip that you showed, we, no, we didn't show the clip of Big James and John uh, plowing the field, did we? We didn't. No. We didn't. But it is, if you, if you haven't seen the show, it's worth, it's like every job you've ever set out to do that you feel like you should do or you've been tasked with and maybe it's a good thing and Jesus tells them they're going to be doing this and it's going to have an impact for generations. Yeah. And they're like plowing a field. Yeah. And it just, the, the humor of, well, two brothers. So, I mean, I, yeah. I could totally picture myself doing this with my brother, complaining about people that we didn't like. Yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather be doing this and, and they're sweaty and dirty and, yeah. and I'd rather to do this and listen for one minute to listen ha- or to have to listen to Matthew for one minute talk about whatever or listen to Simon or you know they're they're doing all this but they're really feeling like they're doing God's God's work and Jesus gave them a special job to do and it's going to have impact for generations they admit they don't know what that means but it sounds important so let's do it and then they find out that oh man this was I mean the look on their face when they figure out that uh, and Jesus and I like how they portray Jesus like, yeah, good job, boys. 
Good job. He's patting him on the back. And, you know, in front well, of everybody hilarious. else. And then the other hilarious part is Andrew and Peter wanting to escort Jesus to the, the people who yes. have done a good deed that day. Can we escort you there, Joe? Okay. He walks into <laughs> the, the next, next room. room. <laughs> so he really plays it up. Yeah. And I think there's those are lessons, though, that I you can totally see Jesus yeah. just going, yeah, yeah, of course you can. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate you offering to do that for me. And yeah, the boys worked really hard today. All those things are true, but the reasoning that they did those things clearly were not because they were looking for even what they didn't understand. And But yeah, yeah, we worked hard. And, and then when they realized, the look on their face when they realized it's Melek and it's yeah. his field, and they're oh, like, oh. It, Samaritan field. Yeah. I thought we were going to do something that's going to last <laughs> generations. Oh. And I just totally, I totally thought about what would I not want to do if God told me everything he put in front of me in my path that was yeah. going to be important, but if I knew what it was, there's no way I'd do it. It just because I'm just I'm anti-authoritarian that way. Red, like no, that nah, I don't no see the, I don't see the benefit in that at yeah. all. But then when you see the end, yeah, when the the Melik story continues to be, and he becomes the the genius of the storytelling, and he becomes the the bad Samaritan. Yeah, I just think that was that was maybe the funnest part so far in the series. Yeah. Of and that's really creativity. hard to do, right? Because yeah, the in because these series this series is relatively short. Each each episode is relatively short with a neat package. I liked again the chaotic piece of order out of chaos because in a sense that's what these these stories were all about. Was it doesn't make sense? This does not seem to be even the whole thing. It does seem a little bit disjointed, but in the end, it does come through. And I think that's the part, maybe even an answer to Mariana's question mm. is I don't get this, why I'm in the middle of this and um, and trust that it does come out in a sense. Uh, Maybe it goes back to that it. quote that I used last week from Desire of Ages that where Alan says that um, yeah. all of us would choose yeah. to go where if we could see the end from the beginning and the good that God has in mind for us if in even those those hard things and sometimes that's it's a little hard for me to fathom how that can be true can but be true right now. but yeah. I've seen enough of it in my life to believe it. Right. Sure. Well, and I thought the other, the maybe the final thing that was on the Melek story and the the of <laughs> the bad Samaritan was that much the same as Big James and, and John plowing the field, they don't get it. They don't know why. Melek Melk didn't even get it. He doesn't get it. He doesn't <laughs> yeah. know what's happening. What do you want? He doesn't know even before that. He doesn't know why he's been dealt this hand where he's had to consider he's like i could see i mean he's he's crying hold trying to hold it together he's like i can see the 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 bones and the ribs on my child we did not have food you don't you know like you don't understand what we were up against and what caused me yeah. to consider this in the first place like i'm, I'm not a bad person yeah. but i was driven to this much like simon saying you know matthew i did things i would have never done if it hadn't been for you yeah early in earlier episodes and so it really the it kind of corresponded on both that it didn't matter whether you were a Jew, a Gentile, whether you're a believer, non believer, things happen and we don't we don't get why. And maybe going back to that again with why have you called me? Why did you give me this job to do? And Melik, why am I suffering? And why did I even why did I do this? This is crazy. But then to to see that I wonder how much of those because we don't really see like in Melik in today's world, you don't see a cause and effect because Jesus isn't standing next to you. And even though Jesus wasn't standing next to him when he healed them in the episode, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. And he's like, when he's after they've had the conversation about the haunted room. <laughs> right. And they're like, someone is waking up happy right now. And they're like, you don't have to be there to heal someone. <laughs> and, but I thought about that and I thought, you know what? He doesn't have to be no. physically here to heal us even now. But how many things do we get healed? Maybe not like in this story that, again, the holy imagination, the story he heals Melek's leg that was broken. But how many things does he heal for us that we've prayed for, we've asked for, that others have prayed for us in our lives, whether they be small, whether they be life changes that we need to make? But they're so small and they go away over time. And do we really give God the credit for the healing that we've asked for when, or the improvement in the area that we've asked for? Because it's not a 
Well, I didn't wake up with pain and I can walk this morning where yesterday I was on a crutch and my leg was in a full, you know, full splint cast. I just wonder how much we lose out on the beauty of what God really is doing and what he's providing to us that we just don't have a clue of because we don't have that experience. And that's the one we always want, you know, the healing or the, the physical part that we can see. Well, the next, the very next breath we take the, is a miracle. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And that's easy enough to forget because you just, exactly. you just breathe, right? It's just, it's, it's normal. Uh, I wanted to go over, Ken used First uh, John 4, 7 through 10 as the basis. And just the, a couple of things that if, you know, Mariana, this, this goes back to what you've, what you said and, and someone that might be in that place. And just some of the things that Ken brought out about this was, God is love. God is for us, not against us. He loved us first. He chose us when we were sinners. He sent Jesus for the guarantee of us having eternal life. His love for us isn't dependent on our love for him. I mean, all of those things, If you need, when you stop to think of each one of those are pretty cool all on their own. And then you add those together and it goes back to that gratitude thing. And, and then we're reminded else. that God wants us to love that way. Right. Yeah. And so you said his love really is there for us to love him back and to, to love others that way. That's pretty cool. And, you know, what he asked, what he asked of Melek, I thought was really cool too. And Melek is like, why well, I, I can't read. What am I going to get in the, how am I going to get yeah. in the Torah? You know, but <laughs> so like, listen, go back to community. Like you said, yeah. go yeah. back and join this and, and learn and then just tell others. I'm not asking right. you to do a ton of crazy things. Just tell others. And I think, though, it uh, that brought me back to Big James and John in the field again. Sometimes telling others is by doing. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. by words. And just to find those opportunities uh, for that. And then we closed out. And I'll, I'll admit, I am a, I'm not a big fan of the altar call. No. Just in my life. Just it's been, <laughs> ah, it's just, it's got a stigma for me. And, but how beautiful was that this week? That so many people that just you know silently came forward, and uh, and Ken, I just man, I uh, had tears in my eyes as you were hugging people and um, inviting them to come up. That was that was beautiful. There were people that were really, really touched and really moved. Even those that didn't come forward. That um, again, that transparency as a leader, I think we all just appreciate that so much. Well, I want to be clear. I'm not a big fan of manipulative. <laughs> Uh, altar calls where you is there yet one more? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, um, you know, for me though, it felt I, right. I also I've become more of a fan of altar calls because whenever we put an action to a decision, it it embeds it more. Mm, and yeah. so when you invite somebody, not just simply to think, do I, am I choosing this, but to put an action behind the thought, it makes that decision more tangible and more real yeah and uh i think that uh probably the uh just you know being careful about how we do it like i said i don't i don't really particularly like it when we're manipulative about things but i as i was preparing that sermon as i saw how everything was coming together and this the the song that was chosen was actually for the closing oh come to the altar i didn't choose that the music team before seeing my sermon had chosen that song and it just as i as I was wrapping up working on my sermon, I got the songs that were going to be sung for that week and the lyrics. And I was like, well, this is, this, this feels like something that needs to happen to give people the chance to, to put an action with their decision. You know, we got, we, we, one of the cool things about the service this last week is we had, uh, we, we got to witness three baptisms yeah. and the three people tangibly putting action to a decision that they'd made, that they were, they were getting baptized as a symbol of, of death to an old way of life and uh, coming to, into a new life and f- choosing to follow Jesus and just all that beautiful uh, metaphor that goes with it. And so the cool thing was I had actually had several people after the service say, hey, we want to do, do that too. I think it's great that, and it just, it, it, maybe it's just the medium and the way it's been done in the past that has the stigma, but honestly, putting the call out there. I mean, we really do that every week. I mean, that's what a message is for is to, is the call to the heart to say, here I am. Take a step. Come come take a step forward in the next walk in your journey. So I just thought it it worked out really well. It didn't feel like anything more than just a transparent ask that, you know, if you've been moved in any way and this is, you know, come forward and 
that was um, it was moving. It was powerful. So I'm glad I'm glad that's the way we or you took it on anyway. Well, I'm glad that's how we all we all chose to to end it together. This this particular series it has been a a really meaningful series to to plan and to be a part of and just have enjoyed the response. Uh, I had I had somebody come up to me on. Uh, at church and say, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure, you know, kind of to what we talked about earlier, I, you know, I wasn't really sure about, about this whole chosen thing, but I got to tell you now, now I'm all in. I just, I'm watching them, I'm loving them. And it's, I can, I, I, yeah, so it's been fun. And, you know, my goal is not to convert people to the chosen. My goal is to convert people to Jesus. That's what I want. And that's what I love about the, the chosen is I don't, it's not the end. It's the end. It's, it's the, it's a way of getting people to get fired up about Jesus. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get to the questions and the comments from the chat. Anonymous 7 said, is it bad to envy or not like people who are wealthy? I think that's uh, going into the, the melody. <laughs> I think that one got teased at the yeah, end of either first right. or second service. Yeah. Yep. Is it bad to not like people who are wealthy? To envy or not like people. I mean, I guess if you're envious, it doesn't mean you maybe don't not like you know. So I'm just like going to go with yes. <laughs> I'm just going to go with yes. Um, I don't think it's helpful. I'm not sure I'd qualify bad or good. I think it is bad from the standpoint of just envy. Think, well, to yeah. the point of it's not good for you. Right. Right. It, yeah. It's not because I mean I think all of us at probably one point or another, or maybe I shouldn't say all of us, but many of us at one point or another have said, oh, it sure be nice to have a car that ran. It sure be nice to not have to worry about what I'm going to do when the air conditioning goes out in my house and I don't really have an emergency fund for it. I remember a couple of years ago, I was, um, <laughs> I had been looking at, at some some folks, some friends who had a much nicer house than I had been on. I've you know, been like, you know, it would be nice to yeah. be able to afford that kind of thing, and had somebody walk up to me and be like, boy, it must be nice to be in the house you're in. And I looked at the house there and I was like, yeah, you're right now that I think about it. So I think we don't help ourselves when we're envious. I think that not liking people, none of us want to be not liked because of because of the car we drive or don't drive or because of what we have or don't have. And so when we, when we do that to people, we're objectifying them when we're not making them human beings. Um, and so I think it's not healthy for us to be doing that. I think most people in their honest moments say, yeah, but it's understandable. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it is. I okay. think I think it does limit us, though. And, it does. Sure. Yeah. Well, and that was actually that was no name. Sorry. And Anonymous 7 actually asked, based on the days we're living, do you think Jesus is coming soon? Yes, indeed. Oh, uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I think it's hard to. Hard to argue with the fact that even I mean, although we say that, and then the 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 response I get a lot as well when I was a kid, my parents and my my grandparents thought oh, that yeah. they weren't you know they were they'd see Jesus in their lifetime, and well now they're dead, and my parents are getting older, and they're starting to wonder if they're going to see Jesus in their lifetime. So why is our lifetime any different? If the apostles can use that same word, we can too. Absolutely, and I, I don't. You know, if um, if my children were to move away to a far off place and I didn't know when I was going to see them again, I would live in eager expectation of seeing them soon. Hmm, and yeah. I and when I look at what's happening around the world, and you look at what the Bible has to say about what's going to happen before Christ returns, it's hard to deny that we're living in a time where. Most, but not all, of the things that the Bible has foretold would happen before Jesus would return have happened or are happening. And so, for me, um, if Jesus comes back in the next year, I'm not going to be surprised about it. And if he doesn't come back for, if if I get to the point where I'm about ready to pass away, it's not going to shake my faith that he hasn't returned either. Yeah. It's um, I just live in eager anticipation. The good news for me is that whenever I close my eyes and and sleep in Jesus, the next thing I know, I'm going to see Jesus. And in that sense, Jesus is coming in my lifetime that, you know, sure. sleep is just a brief pause and it'll and wake up to, to seeing Jesus. And 
Um, I just always want to live in that eager anticipation of him coming back. But yeah, I do. Yeah. When I look around at the way the world is, um, you know, one of the things that about, I guess I don't want to go too far down other series that I may be doing in the future, but when you look <laughs> at, at at the way that the world is, one of the things that we're told before the flood, before the flood in Noah's time was that the world was filled with violence. And it, it's not just talking about like, killing people. It's talking about verbal violence. It's talking about physical violence as well. And it seems to me in my lifetime that the level of violence, violent speech, people just not being loving as is defined in the Bible has increased. And so for me, it feels like Jesus must be coming soon because it just seems like there's a lot of hate and anger and um, just violence yeah. in the world. Maybe one of the best things about the chosen for me has been how they have put Jesus. They don't allow anyone to put him on the spot about when things are going to happen because they've they've taken this mantra and they put words in his mouth that when he says, well, you know, they're like, what does soon mean? And he's like, ah, there's that word again, soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that it happens multiple times in multiple episodes across the seasons. And it really, it again, it's the holy imagination. It, it, those aren't Jesus' words. But I feel like those are Jesus's feelings or sentiments as what he probably felt like or like what you know because that's the question everyone right. wants to know and it was always just like so it, it just to me it brings a little comfort just to to think about jesus saying to me yeah don't worry about it. It, it there's that word again soon you know that's uh like no one knows the bible's clear and and for jesus just to say hmm Soon, there's that word again. I that I really have enjoyed that part of it. And when I think about those kinds of things, if it's you know when is Jesus coming back, those kinds of things. If there's any angst or worry that goes with it, but anonymous seven also asks, why is it so easy to worship Christ when everything is going good? A lot of people def- define Jesus in their life by how much they are blessed. And I would say almost as equal from people in my experience. It's <laughs> you you don't often come to the feet of Jesus until you absolutely positively have to. You have exhausted all other options and you're like, well, here I am. So I guess you're, hey, how's it going? It's been a while. Let's, uh, what you got for me <laughs> that I didn't get before or that I didn't understand before. But I think I think it's dangerous either way to to just not be engaged. So the answer is, Maybe it's based on your personality, your life experience, how you were raised, many different things. Because we all seem to do, maybe we all play both of it. I mean, sometimes it feels good in both areas to me. I like it when things are going bad and it's, I'm not going to worry about it. Because if God needs it to be something else, he's going to have to work it out because I don't have any more answers. But I also like it when it's good and you, you know, you at least try to say, well, man, things have, you know, not to jinx Knock on that wood. Don't do, don't jinx anything. But maybe I should also be asking, hey, things have been going pretty good for me right now. Maybe you could put someone in my path that could use a little help or a little, you know, maybe a positive word. Well said, Randy. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. That one, uh, I've seen both sides. Of that. I don't know if there's an answer necessarily to that. So Elaine Grace G said, this sermon series has been wonderful. It has opened my eyes in so many ways. Thank you, Pastor Ken and all. So we will say thank you to Eileen Grace. Yeah. Thank you so much. And ALBJ said, I love how Ken pointed out you don't need to watch The Chosen to understand how much Jesus loves us. Just read the Gospels. Amen. Amen. And uh, I just I just thought that was good that... I just felt like there would be people that would say, "Whoa, wow, that's crazy!" The, the chosen. We're gonna, we're gonna do a. How many series have you done on a TV show? Was this your first? You haven't done one like on Seinfeld or, you know, <laughs> I Love Lucy. Or no, I haven't. But anything uh, like maybe that. that's next summer. <laughs> maybe, <who knows? laughs> Not that there's anything wrong people with that. People can send in their suggestions for next summer's uh, series. There. Yeah. yeah. There you go. But I think it's good though because this is again just the encouragement that yeah, this is a show and we have made clear that that's what it is and holy imagination, all that good stuff. But just go to the scriptures. Well, yeah, I think I, I, part of this, obviously, this is a good series, but mm-hmm. but we're still looking at, yeah. a, you know, a, somebody's idea of what this is about. And, and yet, I think that we get a chance to celebrate 
art. Mm. You know, mm, yeah. that's yeah. one of the things that, you know, we see is we've even seen a, tra- you know, a trajectory of how it started. And then we saw it towards the last season, sure. even the, the way in which it was done, the production quality, so forth. So I think it's also, it's not just the story, but it's also the appreciation yeah. of those things that are beautiful. And Thank all, you, Dallas Jenkins. Well, yeah. and, and everyone will complain about bad Christian media mm-hmm. that's produced. There's a ton of it out there that's just not very good. Mm-hmm. So why not celebrate when somebody gets a, a, a really good idea, they bring it to fruition, and then they improve on it every single season. I feel like from, like you said, yeah. Jeff, from season one yeah. to three, not that they're all not good, but I think they've really found their see, groove. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, a, there's yeah. definitely an upward motion to this. You know, this isn't that far off from you know how we saw the renaissance right and how they they used art to they matter of fact if you go back to the middle ages they didn't have movies and they didn't have and most people couldn't read so they used art in in a way that portrayed the you know the stories of the bible jeff you just gave me an idea for a sermon series there you go cathedral ceilings and glass stained glass Uh, windows yeah the (laughs) renaissance yeah uh, art yeah like there you go. And Jesus. Most, said, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Jesus and art. Yeah. Jesus and art. All right. Well, I've I've thoroughly I love that series, but I, I have thoroughly enjoyed it actually. I and I think that it also took from what different people that have watched it and some friends of mine that have watched from afar on just online only, assuming that we were going to just rehash every episode as the message. When in fact it was okay. What are they talking about? What are the deeper meanings behind what you know what they were trying to portray? And I think that um, genuinely surprised a few people. And I, I, I didn't know where we we're going with it either. I can't always surprises me. So <laughs> I just I'm just along for the ride. For you good know? or bad. For good or bad, I'm along for the ride. So. Sorry to see it go, but in the same time, I'm excited to continue. We got, sure, got a couple more seasons. Get, we got a really uh, fun sermon coming up this next week. Oh, I heard. Wait a minute. Now I heard it was a new guy. <laughs> new guy. Or a, yeah, right. yeah. New I would to, say a veteran. How a about ve- that? A veteran. A vet. <laughs> a vet. <laughs> Jeff, what it's are we? Way too. Uh, what are we talking about this week? Old of a time. Um, that's the sermon title is called Red Hair and Chrysler's, but so it's on Ken. It's. <laughs> It's Except I don't care for Chrysler, so oh, there you go. You got so the, it can't well, really go man, down okay. that road. Yeah. Redheads and, and Fords, Fords so that would yeah, work out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it is about you know the culture of our church. Um, I get a priv- I'm privileged to be a part of what new members go through when they come mm. to whole life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is it. Uh, what does it mean to be part of a community? Love it. I like that. If you've never been, and I'll, I'll just be honest, this, I don't know how many new, how many churches I've attended and become members in my life, three or four, but the new member orientation process here at, at Whole Life Church is different than, I will promise you, <laughs> it's probably different than any other church you're ever going to go to. And when and he- Jeff is actually our, uh, making yeah. plans to up the game even yeah. more, we're yeah, we've got some fun got some plans good ideas. for the future. Yeah, it just—I love the fact that we're intentional about membership and we're intentional about participation and just letting people know, like you know, this might this might be a great fit for you, but it might not be too. Right. Why should you be unhappy? Why should you know? Why should this? Why should, we, why should, why should, we? Why should, why should we be? Unha- you know? But no, I, I remember sitting and Jeff was just like you know. And just, but it was a, it's in a very loving way. Of course, it's just like you know, these are our ideals. These are the nine things that we hold dear. This is our mission and our vision. And if this isn't something like, if you're, if you don't, don't want to like be involved and be a part of the family, then you probably, I mean, in all honesty, I mean, and that's what I appreciated was this probably isn't going to be the church for you. And that's not, that's, uh, <laughs> that's not unique to us. That G- if you remember in John chapter. I want to say oh, six, I think, where he's just gone through the uh, feeding of the 5,000. 5, and right after that, he has that long discourse with those people who are following him, kind of opportunists. And he gave some, he gives them some pretty harsh, harsh words, words of what it means <laughs> to follow him. <laughs> yeah. And it says, many of them left. left. Yeah. So that's, um, it's not, 
we're not the you know I'm not trying to say that you're going to leave after new member no orientation. no I mean we everyone that went to our classes There's some people went, thinking right what do they do yeah. in new member orientation <laughs> well I would suggest maybe you you know if you're looking for a new church home maybe you ought to find out yeah there that's, you what, go. that's what I'd say because and it's fun by the way it is fun we had a great time we do it Ken's actually part of it now we're doing it we're going to up it I think I love the idea of what we might be implementing down Ooh. the road so so if there was ever a reason if you're looking you're church hopping. You know, Orlando, that's a big thing. When we moved here, I could not believe Stop that. hopping and find your lily pad. That's there it. Just go. come on home. I mean, you know, there's... There's a, so many churches in Orlando. And by the time you get through all of them, and then... No, we didn't get nearly through all of them. But when you find some place, um, you know, that, that hits that hits that right note, yep. and when you go to new employee, or new employee, new <laughs> member orientation, you will know too many years of being yeah. going to new employee yeah. orientation and, and, would, and leading out. But, yeah. yeah. And I would just say there's a lot of great churches in Orlando. There Absolutely. Are. A lot yeah. of really great churches. Um, yep. And the best church for you is the one where you want to be growing. Where you want to be and where you're going to be growing. That's and it. where you can help. We believe that that's yep. probably here. It's so the best but one. If you need to talk to someone, you can just <laughs> you let me know. Podcast at whole life church. I'll get that over to Jeff uh, <laughs> uh, expediently on your behalf. So, all right. So it's going to be Jeff this week, and then do we want to just tell them what's coming up after that? The week after that, we have another guest speaker, Tomas, and one of the really cool programs that we have at this church is called Pathfinders, and it is a just an incredible organization for young people. Um, you're going to kind of find out a little bit more about that, but oh, okay. the director of Pathfinders, Tomas Diaz, um, will actually be speaking um, on that Sabbath. And this year, I want to say we have 135 Pathfinders. A couple more. I was I was at the yeah. meeting on Saturday afternoon. They've done more. They got even uh, more. They had, uh, they had a couple walk-ins wow. as well. <laughs> so there's so. a lot. So anyway, so it's going to be a really, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be very special. And then after that, we are jumping into our Seven Churches of Revelation uh, series, which I'm really looking forward to as well. Okay. Uh, well, and if you want to find out more information about Pathfinders or their younger peeps that are also here, yeah, adventurers. adventurers, I will have the links in the show notes. It's just whole life church slash Pathfinders or path, uh, whole life church slash adventurers, and you can find out more and get in contact with the people there and that are taking care of things. That's it. So, everyone, thanks for listening and have a fantastic week.